welcome back everyone in previous classes we basically discussed how to formulate equation of motion for undamped system and as well as damped system now as we discussed damping that we used in our differential equation of motion it is of type linearly viscous damping okay so the question comes if we have a structure or a system how do we actually determine the value of damping in a structure okay so in today's class basically we are going to look into how to experimentally determine the value of damping what are the different methods that are available okay we are going to learn about two methods specifically logarithmic decrement method and then there's another method which is called half power bandwidth method and we are also going to see the nature of damping in a structure is not always of viscous type but we can equate the energy dissipation mechanism in a structure to a viscously damped system and find out the properties or the equivalent viscous properties of the system because it allows us the simplified differential equation that can be easily solved okay so let us get started with the today's lecture so till now what we have covered in free vibration is actually two types of free vibration the first one that we discussed is undamped free vibration okay so we discussed undamped free vibration and the second type of vibration uh, free vibration that we discussed was damped free vibration okay and we set up the equation of motion for these two uh, type of free vibration so we know that for undamped free vibration we won't have any damping term okay so let me write down the equation of motion here so there is no damping term here and of course applied force is zero on the right hand side for damped free vibration we had and then now we also had damping term here so let me just uh, delete it okay so we had this term here and this was equal to zero and for a given initial condition let us say u0 and u dot of zero similarly for this for this type of vibration we derived the solution of this differential equation uh, for the displacement at any time t okay and uh, we saw that the ut for this was u of zero time cos of omega and t plus we had u dot of zero times sin of omega and t okay and for this we got it as u of t equal to u of 0 cos omega dt plus u dot 0 and then theta omega u of 0 divided by omega t sin omega dt okay so few important things to note uh, for these uh, two uh, displacement histories uh, if you look at uh, the displacement history for undamped part okay what we have here is a constant amplitude that can be written as uh, basically uh, something as uh, u0 times cos omega and t minus phi where u0 is the amplitude of this motion okay and uh, it can be written as times u dot of 0 omega n 
equal to square. Okay, as opposed to if we try to write down the equation of motion of this uh, displacement history for damped free vibration, we can write it as okay, and then the inside term I can write as some constant u times cos omega d minus phi, where u is nothing but u of 0 times okay so this is the expression that we get for u so uh, basically let me write this one as again u naught can be written as e to the power minus Theta omega nt times u this quantity. So you can see if you compare the amplitude of undamped free vibration and damped free vibration, you could easily see that for undamped free vibration, this does not depend on time, it is actually a constant value. Okay, only depends on the initial conditions and omega n. Okay, and it remains constant with time as opposed to the second. Uh, amplitude that we have here for damped free vibration in which I have this exponentially decreasing term that is multiplied with this u to give me the amplitude at any time t. So amplitude is actually decreasing over time. Okay and if you wanted to draw both of these displacement histories okay on the plot here so let us say this is my u of t and this is t all right so in this case let us say with some initial condition my free vibration starts like this with constant amplitude over time okay and then my damped free vibration will start at the same initial condition however it will decrease over the time okay so it is going to decrease over the time all right and this is the envelope curve which represents the decreasing amplitude of the damped free vibration all right uh, second thing to notice is that in undamped free vibration my system is actually vibrating with the frequency omega n okay however in damped free vibration my system is vibrating with frequency omega t and of course we saw that relation between omega d and omega n is nothing but this okay which for small values of zeta omega d is approximately equal to omega n all right so once we have uh, uh, this clear okay uh, before going any further uh, this zeta is nothing but remember this damping ratio we define this damping ratio zeta okay as c by c critical all right and uh, where c is the damping coefficient of the system that is being considered and c critical is the the critical value of the same damping coefficient for which it would inhibit or it would transition from an oscillatory motion to a non-oscillatory motion okay and you know i mean we derive the value of that uh, C critical it was nothing but 2m omega n which can be further uh, written as if you write omega n is under root k by m this uh, you can write is as 2 under root k m all right okay once uh, uh, we have the expression for zeta we saw that uh, depending upon the value of zeta for example I could have a system with damping ratio less than 1 I could have a system with damping ratio 1 or a damping ratio greater than 1. Okay, and we categorize the system based on these damping ratio as either under damped system, okay, or critically damped system here. Or over damped here. 
all right and uh, most of the uh, you know uh, civil engineering structures are actually uh, fall in this category of damped system okay typical civil engineering structure would have damping coefficients which are smaller than 0.1 or 10 percent okay but uh, there might be some systems which would be critically damped and over damped especially if you think about like shock absorber or things like a retracting door mechanism that you have uh, they utilize critically damped or over damped systems okay so these would find the second uh, the, the next two uh, uh, damping uh, systems would be more characteristic more like you know it would be uh, more common for mechanical system or aerospace systems okay so our focus of study would be limited to under damped system from here on all right okay once uh, that is clear let us see how do we utilize the damped free vibration and undamped free vibration, this type of free vibration to get the system properties okay so basically how to determine experimental determination experimental determination of system properties or structure properties for our case and the structure properties that i'm spe specifically talking here could be time period it could be if it's an undamped system let us say undamped uh, time period if it's a damped system it would be a damped time period and if it's a damped system another parameter to find would be the damping ratio okay now remember it is very critical to find the damping ratio in many cases because we we said that uh, there are several sources of energy dissipation in a system and uh, just because we cannot explicitly mathematically model those mechanisms for example friction at the joints you know uh, internal elastic straining of materials so we said that all of those energy dissipation will represent using viscous damping and for that viscous damping what we derive the expressions for zeta and everything so uh, it's always uh, like you know one would be the critical parameter that we can determine using the experimental uh, tests now what do we need to determine those would be the displacement history okay so let us say displacement history is given to us all right so if the displacement history is given to us okay we need to determine what would be these properties okay and let us see how do we do that okay now for damped system we said that the displacement at any time t can be represented as u of t equal to u times capital u times zeta t times cos okay uh, not a bracket here so it would be cos omega d minus phi all right where the expression for u is already uh, known to us which depends on the initial condition initial conditions and the uh, frequency of the uh, system okay now let us consider okay let us consider the displacement here and the next displacement here okay so basically what i'm saying consider two peaks of the displacement history okay at time t so of course the next peak would be at time t plus td okay so let us say u1 is at u of t so that my next uh, peak is at u of t plus td okay now let us see what do we get as expressions for these okay so if i write u1 by ut the ratio of these two peaks okay you substitute in this expression that you have here you'll get as theta omega t times cos of omega d minus phi okay and the second uh, the denominator would be 
basically again same u however i'll have to replace t with the t plus td and then again cos omega d t plus td minus phi okay now remember that cos is a periodic function right it's a periodic function with a period of 2 pi okay and omega d times td is basically 2 pi okay so this uh, denominator cos term would be equal to the uh, same as whatever the cos term you have the numerator all right and then you are left with so u will also the capital will u will also get cancel off so if you simplify this ratio what you will get as this e to the power zeta omega n td okay and if you look at this value carefully uh, see that there is no time term in here so what i'm saying u1 by u2 is actually constant okay and the same would be true for any time t and t plus tt okay so any successive two successive peaks would have the same ratio all right so i can say that this is also same because remember the time t that i had considered here was any random time t it doesn't have to be the first peak or second peak two successive peak so u1 by u2 would also be equal to u2 by u3 okay equal to u3 by u4 and so on all right okay so that actually remains constant okay now uh, if you look at this value here my zeta omega and td can be written as zeta omega n and td is nothing but tn divided by 1 minus zeta square okay and omega times tn is 2 pi so i will write this as 1 minus zeta square okay now we represent basically this as a value that is called delta okay and this delta plays an important role in further uh, because this ratio is very important so what do i have here is actually u1 by u2 is equal to e to the power delta here and if i take the logarithmic the natural log of both sides i will get delta as nothing but equal to ln u1 by u2 okay or it can also be said ln u2 by u3 and so on okay any ratio of any two successive peak and uh, a log of that ratio is the value ln now this is called the logarithmic decrement this ratio is called logarithmic decrement because this is the ratio through which the successive peaks actually reduces due to damping all right now this uh, lambda here that we have oh, sorry this delta here that we have 2 pi zeta for a small value of zeta this actually is denominator that uh, we have here is approximately equal to 1 and we can write this as 2 pi zeta and this is like you know an accurate enough uh, uh, representation for all zeta smaller than 20 percent which covers almost most range of structures uh, for our purposes okay now if i have that then i can write 2 pi zeta equal to ln u1 by u2 so the damping can be obtained as the damping ratio can be obtained as ln u1 by u2 now remember u1 and u2 is they are these quantities are available to you from the experimental time or experimental displacement history that you obtained from your tests okay which you know you know you can utilize either use of a string potentiometer or some other uh, lab testing uh, instrumentation through which you can obtain that but the idea is that 
your damping is nothing but 1 by 2 pi ln u1 by ut okay all right once you have that then you this method will help you in determination of the damping okay now let us further discuss one thing uh, let us say you have a system which has a very small value of damping okay now if the damping is very uh, small then what happens that this uh, decrement between successive peaks are also very small okay so those are not as prominent as you see here not by this much but even further is small okay so this decrement is actually much smaller okay so let me try to draw this okay, i'm trying to be accurate but and so on okay now in this case what happens if you take two successive peaks for example here and here then there could be a lot of error due to actually reading it might be reading error okay or it might be some other error okay but it would lead to some error in the estimation of the damping value so what we try to do for lightly damped systems we do not consider one peak but we consider over multiple peaks so that we the error is actually distributed for example in this case let us consider this peak which i would call as peak i and after j number of cycles i would consider another peak which is peak j so this is i plus jth peak after j number of cycles okay so this is j number of cycles all right so i will have i plus j and it will have j number of cycles i get this all right now let us see what happens if i consider any peak ui okay and the ratio of this with respect to any peak which is after j number of cycles so i have ui plus j okay so in this case what i can do i can write this as ui ui plus one then ui plus one ui plus two and so on then ui plus j minus one and then ui plus j okay now i know that the ratio of successive peaks are nothing but the logarithmic decrement delta right so what i am going to do here i am going to write this e to the power delta from this expression here again e to the power delta and so on to the power delta this would be j number of times okay because there are j number of cycles all right so this would add up in the to the power and it would give me e to the power j delta so if i take the uh, log of both side i get delta as 1 divided by j times ln ui plus ui plus j okay and if you write delta as 2 pi zeta ignoring the denominator term then the damping zeta can be calculated as 1 by 2 pi ln ui ui plus j okay now this is over j number of cycles so let us say if you had considered only successive peaks right to calculate the damping you would it would lead to the reading error because now you are considering only two peaks so there would be reading error in u1 and u2 okay and then you are you are just using that ratio to get the damping however let us say you are using 10 number of peaks okay so the ratio over 10 number of peaks would decrease more and the error the reading error is actually gets divided over 10 number of cycles so you are likely to get more accurate reading if you consider multiple number of cycles all right okay so basically once we have this method which is called logarithmic decrement method 
to determine the damping or the viscous damping in the system. Okay, we will utilize this to get the value. So once we'll have zeta, okay, uh, if this is displacement history is given to you from the experiment, this you can also use to get the value of TD. Okay, and then if the TD is known, then the natural vibration frequency can also be obtained using minus theta square. Okay. All right. Okay. Once uh, you have this, let us see how we can utilize this. So basically using this, it, uh, these uh, displacement history, you can obtain these two values okay and uh, you know you can look at some examples where they have provided the displacement history to obtain the damping ratio of the system okay all right next topic that we are going to study let me just fix this so next topic that we are going to study would be the energy dissipation or the energy at any time t in a free vibrating system okay and let us see how do we do that okay so what we are trying to study here is i think it has a energy and free vibration okay and let us first consider undamped free vibration okay so we are going to first consider undamped free vibration okay now if i uh, draw the spring mass representation i basically have this stiffness spring k this mass m which is going through the displacement ut okay and the initial conditions are given to you okay so if these for these initial condition the initial like uh, the input energy uh, to the system can be written as remember there two, would be two type of energy due to velocity of this mass there would be kinetic energy in the system right and due to deformation of uh, in this spring the potential energy is basically obtained as the stiffness energy in this system okay so there are two type of energy in the system and we are going to find out uh, the expression for energy at any time t that is our goal here okay try to find out the energy at any time t in the system okay so let us see the energy first the input energy to the system okay due to the velocity or let me first write down the strain energy so the potential energy is due to the strain energy in the spring which can be written as half k u0 of square and then the kinetic energy i can write it as okay all right now let us see at any time t the displacement is basically given as for undamped free vibration as uh, u0 and cos omega and t plus u dot 0 sin omega and t and the velocity is given as you need to differentiate it once so that you get as minus omega n u0 sin omega n t plus u dot 0 cos omega n t okay so at any time t again the total energy would be sum of the energy in the spring okay uh, which is the strain energy so i am going to write as as es of t and then the kinetic energy of the mass i am going to write it as ek of t ok 
Okay, and if you write it as this ek of this square of this quantity here, okay, plus half of again you'll uh, you can write this as mass times the square of this u dot t here. All right, and. Uh, uh, just keep in mind this relationship that uh, we had that omega n is under root k by m. So you can write k as also as m omega n square. Okay, and if you utilize that and you take omega n outside from this here, let us see what do we get. Okay, so I'm writing as m omega n square, right? This is square is here plus half m omega n square and then I will have a term here which I can write is as minus u0 sin omega n t plus u dot of 0 okay cos omega n t okay and there is this term here okay so I can basically take this common Okay, and well, I will simplify that and add that. Okay, and use the uh, you know trigonometric identity that cos square omega n t plus sine square omega n t is actually one. Okay, basically this will simplify to uh, in this case u zero square plus u dot zero square plus the uh, two a b term will get cancel off for both terms okay okay so you can further write it as so i'm going to multiply this with this and then the same quantity with this except in this case what i'm going to do here is actually write again m m again square is k so the first term that i multiply with this i'm again going to write it as k times u0 square all right and the second term that i am going to write it as would be now remember that i have this term here okay so this is actually not only this much but this whole quantity square okay so when i write the second term this omega n square by omega n square will cancel off and i will get this Okay, so this is the total energy at any time t, which we see is independent of time. And this is what you should expect because this is a free vibration where there is no energy dissipation because we have neglected damping. So theoretically, you know, the system should have the same energy. Okay, energy should be conserved at any time t. Okay, so this is the energy at any time t, which is independent in time. And this is also equal to the initial input energy that we had obtained. Okay, now you could do the same thing for the damped free vibration. Okay, and by using the expression for ut of uh, damped free vibration and exactly following the same procedure. Okay, nothing is going to change here in that case as well. Okay, so you can try that out. But remember, in damped free vibration, when you try that, you will uh, find that the energy is actually up. Uh, function of time and it is decreasing with time okay uh, so oh, if you consider let us say damped free vibration okay you will see that it would actually be decreasing the energy should be decreasing with time okay and uh, that dissipation in the energy is due to the viscous damping that we have assumed in the system now if you have any viscous damping force which is fd and due to uh, this force if there is a dissipation energy and let us say the system is undergoing displacement u right the energy dissipation due to viscous damper can be calculated as force times the displacement do you okay over let us say time t1 okay now we know that Ft can be written as C of C time uh, u dot okay uh, and du is basically nothing but again velocity times dt okay basically du by dt is equal to uh, u dot so 
this is the expression I can further write this as cu dot square times dt and depending upon what the expression is for u dot you can find out how much the energy that is being dissipated in the viscous damping term here all right so we have considered now the energy uh, in a free vibration in the free vibration for a damped system and then we discussed that how you can follow the same procedure to get it for the uh, damped system as well the same procedure as in damped, in damped system okay and the energy dissipated in the system can be calculated using this expression here all right okay so with this uh, the uh, all the topics on free vibrations are finished what we are going to do now we are going to do two examples to demonstrate the principles of this okay and these are uh, practical exam practical examples that you might observe and you would you could have like you know come across this at some point of time okay so uh, for the first example let me consider this okay now uh, many of you would have seen that when something is shipped to you for example if it's an expensive package okay uh, and then you buy it from online retailer or somewhere else or like you know something is getting shipped then it is usually shipped inside a box and if an item is of high value okay so if something is shipped to you it is actually shipped inside a box so this is our example one okay and they put an item they put the item inside the box and they try to fill it up either with some kind of material that provides this protection to this now if the item is of high value and somebody let us say comes to you and asks you like you know uh, that is a very expensive item i want to ship it so i want to design i want uh, you would ask you to design the container and the material this is stuffing material so that it would be protected against any kind of damage due to fall accidental fall or things like that okay so how would you actually go about modeling this problem and then solving this problem okay that is what we are going to discuss in this example all right okay now let us take the example of this uh, expensive item inside the box okay first as an engineer you have to come up with some design parameters okay like you cannot or you should not ship it like you know in a very large box otherwise what will happen the shipping cost would increase and you might think that this is just for one item but just imagine if everybody starts shipping in big boxes how much of cost escalation that would lead to in the uh, shipping and the logistics okay so you have to come up with an efficient design so let us talk about some design parameter okay first thing here would be what is the weight of the item okay let us say it's a mobile phone okay and a typical mobile phone let us say it's a mass of this mobile phone is around 0 0.1 or let us say it is uh, 100 grams so that first let me write it as 100 grams so i can write it as 0 0.1 kgs okay now for uh, this mass right i have to fill this box with some kind of material okay it might be foam it might be like you know just a stuffed paper or it might be some other kind of material uh, it might also be bubble wrap so these are the typical stuffing material that you use and for these materials you would typically have the value of the stiffness constant okay so example if i represent this box with this item inside and basically this is stuffing material providing some kind of flexibility okay to this uh, item that is inside okay now remember that uh, for this problem we would only be focusing on vertical impact because that is more important okay so although there could be they could, it could be represented as horizontal springs we are only worried about the vertical uh, stiffness of the spring okay so these two springs that are important to me right this and this okay so let us say just for the sake of argument it is uh, 10 newton 
parameters. Okay, the third thing would be what could be the typical height of fall because that is going to determine the initial force or initial conditions that would lead to the damage to or the, you know, the vibration or like you know the movement of this item inside the box. Now if you consider typical height of a person is around 1.75 meters right and let us say he is like you know getting up and down in a vehicle so vehicle let us say it is around 0.5 meters from the ground okay so we are talking about let us say 2.25 meters of total height all right and just to add fact some factor of safety i'm saying that the total height over which it can fall might go up to let us say 3 meters okay so i'm considering that at max let us say 3 meter is the typical uh, height of fall that uh, in in case of an accident uh, like an accidental fall now what will happen let us say this box is made up of simple cardboard okay so it's not elastic as soon as it hits the ground the box itself does not bounce but the uh, material inside it starts to vibrate so let us say it is falling over height of 3 meter on the ground so what happens after it falls to the ground both and this like you know the mass of this cardboard is like you know it's uh, although it would have some realistic mass uh, we are going to assume it is negligible compared to the item inside it okay so let us say it is falling so that uh, falling through a height of 3 meter this has mass m and there is stiffness k as soon as it falls what happens all the velocity gets transferred to the system that you have inside that box so this mass here okay and that velocity would be what i can simply write this as under root 2gh okay and if you can calculate that right you can calculate that as 2 times 9.8 times 3 okay and uh, you can calculate this value and uh, uh, that would be the initial velocity okay of the further vibrational or the oscillatory motion of this uh, uh, mass okay so let us see what do we get uh, that as so i'm just going to make some quick calculation here okay and i basically get that as 7.6 okay meter per second and this is the initial velocity so what happens that as soon as it hits the ground the uh, container comes to uh, rest but it imparts initial velocity to the mass inside it and the mass now it starts vibrating okay so the mass inside it it start vibrating with some initial velocity okay now the design parameter on the of would be what should be the dimension of this box and how can we determine that well i can calculate that maximum displacement of mass due to this initial velocity okay and that would provide me the approximate dimension of the box okay so let us say what is the maximum displacement due to initial velocity so can i say that the u naught remember what we had calculated it is u0 square plus u dot 0 this is square remember that this is 0 because there is no initial displacement only velocity u0 the maximum displacement would be simply velocity divided by omega n okay so it would be 7.66 divided by omega n and omega n is nothing but k by m which is 10 divided by 0.1 all right and that gives me a value of uh, 0.766 okay meters all right which is basically 76.6 centimeters all right now of course this is a factitious value and the realistic value would differ now remember the maximum displacement is now this u naught 
okay and it could go in either direction so the box dimension or the box height should be at least two times this displacement so at least two times this 76.6 which gives me 153.2 okay so let us provide a uh, box height of 160 centimeters okay so this i've just demonstrated you like you know a typical application of this kind of system you might think this is very trivial and i'm like you know we are talking about a small stuff here but the same principle could be extended to any kind of system and actually it's like you know uh, the shipping of uh, expensive items is a big thing let us say if you're shipping something you know of the order of value of like you know million or billion of dollars uh, you would not want to skimp like you know on just providing like you know proper packaging so it becomes a very uh, uh, important issue all right okay now let us uh, come to second example okay in the second example we are going to discuss the model of a car okay so let me draw here let us say I have a car. Now, typical mass of a car might be 1000 to 2000 kgs. Of course, it depends on the size of the car as well. Let us say it's a mid size car. Okay. So, let me consider this is a car which is, has a mass of, okay, 1500 kgs. All right. Okay. And the suspension and the tires of this, I'm going to represent it with a spring here and the damping in that suspension tire i'm going to represent with a damper here okay now it is given to you then when it is at rest this car this spring is deflected so initially it is deflected by let us say 10 centimeter which i can write as 0 0.01 meters okay and it is critically damped And it is critically damp. Okay. So, what do you need to find out? What is the damping coefficient of the system? The value of C. What is the damping in the system? Okay. Now, and what is the frequency of vibration? Now, in the second case, what you need to do? Now let us say this this uh, car is now being occupied by four people. Okay, and let us say average weight of each person is like you know the mass of each person is seventy five kgs. So that for four people, they would add around three hundred kgs of mass. So the total mass becomes hundred eighteen hundred kg. You now uh, need to tell me after these four people occupy the car what happens to the value of damping ratio okay now important thing to understand here is that the damping coefficient is the property of the system or the structure and it does not depend on the mass or the stiffness constant okay however the damping ratio zeta is actually which ratio of c by c critical okay and it depends on the mass of the system because c is constant and this i can write as 2m omega n so it depends on the mass of the system so initially it was critically damped so the value of zeta would be one right when we increase the mass of the same system remember the damping would still remain constant c value however when you increase the mass m the damping ratio or zeta would decrease Okay, so it would become under damped and it might start oscillation in the system. Okay, okay, let us go one, uh, uh, like, you know, one step at a time. So for the first, like, you know, for the first part A, let us say this is part A. It is a critically damped system. So zeta is equal to one. Okay, and this should be equal to C by 2m omega n. But remember, it is said that I first need to find out what is the stiffness of the system, right? And it is said that under 
the weight of the vehicle it deflects by 10 cm so can i say that initially k times 10 cm which is 0 0.01 this is equal to what is the weight of the body 1500 times 9.81 okay so from here i can calculate k as 0 0.01 and frequency i can also calculate all right or instead of doing that let us just do this right omega n by k by m and i can write this as 2 under root km okay now c would be zeta is 1 2 under root km so uh, k i know is nothing but 1500 9.81 divided by 0 0.01 okay and then i have m which is again 1500 so i can get the value of c from here okay is that clear now once that is known okay i can also find out the value of omega n from here and then tn from here in the second part what i'm going to do okay now the mass is increased correct okay once the mass is increased and then the frequency is also going to change because that in turns also depends on the value of k right or the m so the mass changes and the frequency changes so what i'm going to do i'm going to take but the thing that is not going to change is the damping coefficient so zeta 2 by zeta 1 if i take the ratio okay i will get that as m2 omega n2 divided or not sorry it would be other way around okay it would be m1 omega n1 okay divided by m2 omega n2 all right now in this case i can further write this as k1 m1 by k2 m2 okay and remember that the k1 or the stiffness of the system is not being changed only the mass is being changed so i can further write this as 1500 divided by 1800 okay which is nothing but all right so this would be Point eight, correct, and then three three like this. Okay, so zeta two would be one. Remember, zeta one is one, so this would be nothing but zero point eight three three, which you can calculate. Okay, and you can write this as zero point nine one okay so damping from the value of 1 it decreases to 0 0.91 it becomes an under damped system and it would uh, you know under the action of uh, force or under the action of like you know initial displacement or velocity it can now vibrate all right so i hope these both problems uh, explained you uh, the principles of uh, free vibration and help you like you know apply those concepts to real life problems okay uh, you can extend this knowledge to different to solve like you know different type of problems in the free vibration okay all right thank you